the Elon Musk has talked about a complete rewrite of uh, the neural net that they're mm -hmm. using. That seems to, again, I'm half paying attention, but it seems to involve basically a kind of integration of all the sensors to where it's a four dimensional view. You know, you have a 3D mm -hmm. model of the world over time, and then you can, I think it's done both for the, for the actually, you know, so the neural network is able to, in a more holistic way, deal with the world and make predictions and so on, but also to make the annotation task more, uh, you know, easier. Like you can annotate the world in one place and it kind of distribute itself across the sensors and across the different, uh, like the hundreds of tasks that are involved in the hydranet. What are your thoughts about this rewrite? Is it just like some details that are kind of obvious that are steps that should be taken? Or is there something fundamental that could challenge your idea that end-to-end -end is the right solution? Uh, we're in the middle of a big rewrite now as well. We haven't shipped a new model in a bit. Of, uh, of what kind? Uh, we're going from 2D to 3D. Uh, right. right now, all our stuff, like for example, when the car pitches back, the lane lines also pitch back uh, because we're assuming the flat, wor ro flat world hypothesis. Uh, the new models do not do this. The new models output everything in 3D. Um, so this, but there's still no annotation. So the 3D is is it's more about the spatial. output. Yeah, uh, the, the, we have we have Z's and everything. Uh, we've Z's. Yeah, we added the Z's. We added the Z's. Um, we we unified a lot of stuff as well. Uh, we switched from TensorFlow to PyTorch. Nice. Uh, my understanding of what Tesla's thing is is that their annotator now annotates across the time dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, cute. Why are you building an annotator? I I find their entire pipeline. I find your vision, I mean, the vision of end-to-end -end, very compelling, but I also like the engineering of the data engine that they've created. In terms of supervised learning pipelines, that thing is damn impressive. You're basically, the, the idea is that you have hundreds of thousands of people that are doing data collection for you by doing their experience. So that's kind of similar to the Kama AI model. And you're able to mine that data based on the kind of edge cases you need. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's harder to do in the end-to-end -end learning, the mining of the right edge cases. Like that's where feature engineering is actually really powerful because like, us humans are able to do this kind of mining a little better, but but yeah, there's obvious as we as we know, there's obvious constraints and limitations to that idea. Uh, Carpathy just tweeted. He's like, um, you get really interesting insights if you sort if you sort your validation set by loss, and look at the highest loss examples. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you can do. We, we have we have a little data engine like thing. We're training a segnet. Um, and I mean, it's not fancy. It's just like. Okay, train the new segnet, run it on 100,000 images, and now take the thousand with highest loss. Select 100 of those by human, put those, get those ones labeled, retrain, do it again. Right? So it's it's a much less well written data engine. Uh, and yeah, you can you can take these things really far, and it is impressive engineering. And if you truly need supervised data for a problem, yeah, things like data engine are the high end of the. Uh, what is attention? Is a human paying attention? I mean, we're going to probably build something that looks like data engine to push our driver monitoring further. Um, but for driving itself, you have it all annotated beautifully by what the human does. So, Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that applies to driver attention as well. Do you want to detect the eyes? Do you want to detect blinking and pupil movement? Do you want to detect all the like face alignments, the landmark detection and so on? And then doing kind of reasoning based on that? Or do you want to take the entirety of the face over time and do end to end? I mean, it's obvious that over, eventually you have to do end to end with some calibration with some fixes and so on. But it's uh, like, I don't know when that's the right move. Even if it's end to end, there actually is, there is no kind of, um, there, the, you have to supervise that with humans. Whether a human is paying attention or not is a completely subjective judgment. Um, like you can try to like automatically do it with some stuff, but you don't have, if I record a video of a human, I don't have true annotations anywhere in that video. The only way to get them is with 
you know, other humans labeling it, really. Well, I don't know. Uh, you, you, so th th if you think deeply about it, you could, you might be able to, just, depending on the task, you might be able to discover self annotating things like, you know, you, you can look at st like steering wheel reversal or something mm -hmm. like that. You can discover little moments of lapse of attention. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where psychology comes in. Is there indicate, because you have so, so much data to look at. So you might be able to find moments when there's like just inattention, that even with smartphone, if you want to detect smartphone use. Yeah. You can start to zoom in. I mean, that's the gold mine, uh, sort of the comma AI. I mean, Tesla's doing this too, right? Is they're, they're doing annotation based on, it's like uh, self-supervised learning too. It's just a small part of the entire picture. Yeah. It's That's kind of the, challenge of solving a problem in machine learning if you can discover self-annotating parts of the problem, right? Our driver monitoring team is half a person right now. I, have a, I would, you know, once we have- Scale to a full, once we like have, two people. Once we have two, three people on that team, I definitely want to look at self-annotating stuff for, yeah. for attention.